friends, welcome to Cashing In on Content Marketing. I'm Amanda Milligan, the Marketing Director at Fractal. And every week on the show, I interview marketing experts about ways to know the value of your work and get buy-in for your strategies. This week, we're exploring how Google updates impact your content strategy. I'm joined by the brilliant Morty Oberstein, official Wix liaison to the SEO community and the host of the SEO Rant podcast, which I was lucky enough to be a guest on. Morty, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. I always like being on the other side of the mic. I feel like there's far less pressure. <laughs> totally, totally get that. <laughs> uh, also, when you get two podcasters together, it's either going to be great or go completely off the rails. <laughs> Only time will tell. <laughs> <laughs> and a lot of editing. Right. So it's funny because when I knew you were coming on the show, I realized I hadn't done an episode about Google updates, which seems wild to me, I, I suppose. I, it's a little more timely than some other topics, but I think that a lot of what we'll talk about will be useful for people going forward. Oh. Uh, but I, yeah, it's definitely going to be useful right now. And it's just a little more timely of an episode, but I think this is really important. I think there's a lot happening in 2021. Yeah. It's a funny thing about updates. I, I feel like there's so many of them, or if, you know, if you go to Barry Schwartz's website, I see round table and Barry reports on, on pretty much all of them, it almost gets diluted. All right. Another update, whatever it happens all the time. And they do. And Google says, Hey, these happen all the time. There's thousands of updates, blah, blah, blah. Obviously some are bigger, some are smaller. But when it, when it comes to the official updates, something like the core updates or the product review update that comes out, I generally find that it's much easier to pick out patterns out of them. I mean, there's something more purposeful about those updates than the the other updates that roll out. And I, I speculate that the smaller updates that you see are either something very specific or Google's testing things out prior to them rolling out one of those bigger updates. Mm -hmm. So it's mm -hmm. harder to find those patterns, harder to see those things. And, it, and, and I think in turn, because it's really hard to pick something out from most updates, we sort of like, all right, another update. What am I going to do with this? I can't do anything about it, blah, blah, blah. And there's really nothing to learn here. When in fact, there are some updates that are really just chock full of amazing things that Google's trying to do. I'm glad you brought this up because I think it could be overwhelming for people who really try to understand every single thing that's happening when a lot of it doesn't apply to them. But then sometimes they overlook the things that could be significant. Like just with the core update, right? I feel like I've seen two camps with uh, Web Vitals. It's it's either I'm freaking out, everyone needs to panic and, and figure out how to prepare. And then the other group of people who's like, it's fine. Like if you're doing a good job so far, you're probably going to be fine. Where do you fall in, in this? Oh my gosh, that's like a million dollar question because there are many times and I see this all the time with sites because I'm an, I'll call myself an algorithm hunter. And by the way, I completely ignore the smaller updates. I just don't even bother paying attention to them anymore. I mean, unless I get hit, then obviously I start paying, atten <laughs> I start paying attention. <laughs> but in, in theory, I don't pay attention to them um, as much, at least. The, you could see you get hit by a core update, and then you'll see sites that just see a reversal, maybe a, a few weeks later or a, a month later or whatever it is. And why did that happen? Who knows? And what did they, they did nothing. It's just, that's just the way that Google treated the site. Mm -hmm. Google's sorting things out. It's parsing different things. It saw us like, this was great. Let's reverse this a little bit. Let's pull that back. Let's pull this signal back a little bit and let things sort of sort out, which is why, you know, the main thrust of an update will happen in the first two or three days. But it does take, I think, the official timeline that Danny Sullivan says, what, like, um, I forget if it's seven days or 14 days, something, two, two weeks, I think. Okay. Is the official timeline for an update to generally finish rolling out because they're always tweaking, going back. And you'll see sites also just, you know, return to normal. I've seen patterns where sites get stuck in, in I call it update mode, where now every single update, whereas before they weren't impacted by anything, now every single update throws them around back and forth in all sorts of reversals. Wow. And in, in the smaller updates, you'll generally, I generally see, I hate to say you because there's so many there's so many different sites and everything I'm saying here. I just want to put a caveat. It's what I see. It's one small sliver of the algorithmic pie. No one has a comprehensive understanding of everything. And what I recommend people do is to look and see people like Glenn Gabe or Marie Haynes or Lily Ray or myself or Dr. Pete for sure. 
what are they what are they writing about and are there similar patterns across all of the things that they're saying and then you see okay there's something going on there um but with, with these updates you can get stuck in a, you can get stuck in a pattern where now all of a sudden google keeps testing your site over and over and over again every single time is one of these minor updates so to say there's one answer but what camp am i in i don't know it really all depends and when google says hey look there's nothing you could do here there's it's all about the content that you have and it's very competitive and there's only so many slots on the SERP and there's, you know, nine or 10 slots on page one and there's thousands upon thousands of sites trying to compete. Sometimes you just, you, you can't. And I don't have a good answer for how do you determine that? All I can say is you can look and I think, I think the mistake people make with the updates, if I'm rambling, you can completely cut me off. No, I'm loving this. Keep going. Okay. Um, if, you know, but people look at winners and losers and 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 niche analysis and all that's really good. Uh, and, and in terms of abstract, for sure, if you really want to track things and where things are going and how things behave, for example, at the niche level, and you, Google has talked about this, so e, uh, YMYL. So technically right. speaking, shopping sites are part of YMYL because you're pulling out your credit card. But the algorithm doesn't treat them the same way as finance and health sites. And Google has actually talked about this. Um, because it makes sense that in one case, health and finance sites, the content itself is the commodity. People are going there to consume. You have a health problem. You're trying to get some information. You have a finance question. You try to get some information. The content is the commodity. Where in finance, the content is not really the commodity. I'm sorry, without retail, the content per se is not the commodity. The commodity is the commodity. You know, the, the pants that you're trying to buy, the computer you're trying to buy. And it's only because, yeah, you're pulling out your wallet, it falls into YMYL. So Google algorithmically doesn't treat it the same way. So there are definitely insights to get when you look at the top level analysis of the winners, the losers, the niches, whatever it is. So I'm not against that sort of data. I've done that sort of data all the time. What I recommend you do as a site though, is to look and see, okay, for my, for my keywords that I lost, I went down, who went up? And then profile the content on the page. You don't have to go. I mean, you could go into the underbelly of, of, of these sites or their technical problems that they don't have that you do have. But I'm not saying you shouldn't. You should do that. But in most cases with the core updates and Google talks about it, it's all about the content and the, it, for the most part in those cases. And in fact, Google's when they actually wrote about uh, on their they have a help doc about this. They talk about and that very rare to have something like this with actually linking to to Barry Schwartz or to Lily Ray, whatever it is, talk about, it's about content. So your first bet, if you see something happen to one of your pages is to take a look at your content, take a look at the pages that replaced you. What's different about them? What are they doing that you, you perhaps are not doing? A, a clear example that I can throw at you is, so September, 2019, and Lily Ray also noticed something like this. So it's always good to have correlation. I noticed there was a bunch of um, loan sites so um, there are pages that were about learning about a small business loan, very like informational pages. I think one of the sites was cabbage.com. I don't remember the name of the other one. And one site really did well. One site just lost all their rankings. And it wasn't like the site that lost was thin, you know, ads all over the place, too many. It wasn't very obvious. And I think people make the mistake of not actually reading the content. You have to read the content mm. on the pages and see what's actually being written because it's getting really, really nuanced. And what was happening was you have a query where it's the, the intent is very informational. It's YMYL. You're talking about people could lose lots of money. They get the wrong information. One of the pages that did okay were pages where they offer the information about the small business loan and it was just information. Very, very, you know, part of here's the information and that's it. Of course, you know, they have on the page I'm sure, were, were snippets of content where they talk about their site and why their site is great to get a loan through. But the content itself, where they talked about the loan, there wasn't any backhanded sell. It was just content for the sake of helping people. The sites that didn't do well had a lot of content, had a lot of very good content, but they intermixed it with, here's why getting this loan is the best idea for you. Almost like, <laughs> like a used car salesman. And Google picked up on the tone. 
and said, yeah. this is marketing tone or marketing language. It's using language to pick up tone. That's not appropriate because this is strictly informational page. So if you're in that kind of vertical, you need to be careful with the tone you're taking. And I've seen it multiple times. So look at what other pages are doing. Really get into the nitty gritty of it. See what they're writing. See how they're structuring the pages. See how they're approaching the content. See how they're approaching the intent behind things and see, okay, can I, am I doing that? Am I doing the opposite of that? Are there, if Google was profiling me, forget Google, if a user was coming to my page and they're trying to get, let's say, purely informational content about whatever it is that's really important, is that really what I'm offering them? Am I going too hard with the sale kind of thing mm -hmm. and profile the content the, the way a user would? And I think that's the way Google's doing it. The, they're profiling the content to see if you match what you say you are and what the user intent is. I love that answer. I think there's a lot to unpack there, but it sounds <laughs> like- I just kind of went on. I love it. <laughs> it sounds like these are great opportunities to almost go back and check in on your original content strategy rather than just like creating these things and letting them exist forever. And yeah. it's going to be fine. It, you know, like you said, you don't have to treat every update like, oh my, I don't know if I'm prepared for this or if I have to go back and edit everything, but it is an opportunity to be like, has Google improved the way that it filters good stuff? And is my content qualified to be still high quality anymore compared to everything yes. else that's out there? And it's always, like, I think back, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight years ago, that sort of acquisition-y kind of content that function as a blog post that you kind of passed off as, hey, it's really helpful, but it's really acquisitional. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of gone to a certain extent. I think Google's onto that sort of thing. Where so five, six years ago, that was good content. And it does have value. But fundamentally speaking, in content like that, you can never get rid of the intent. If your intent is really to draw people in, make the sale, blah, 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 acquisition content, and you try to package it as something educational, informational, it really does seep through. Like you can't hide it, it's there. Mm -hmm. And I think Google's getting really good at picking up on when that's happening. And it may be, yeah, that worked five, six years ago, but that might not be what's considered substantial now. I'll give you a great case of how hard it is. Yeah. So dot govs lost, not significant, I wouldn't say hugely, but they went, their rankings went down as a, as a category in health, uh, in the health niche during the December 2020 core update. And they, so you had, let's say, you know, and I don't, I'm trying to remember the names of the, you know, the CDC is an easy one, NHS and all the other P PDD, blah, blah, blah. I have no idea. Um, I just make, I just made that up. <laughs> I'm pretty sure our PDD is some kind of drug. Anyway, um, <laughs> anyway, so let's say the CDC had a really nice, I, I'll give you the case was something to do with um, our painkillers safe. I think was okay. the key word. And the CDC or one of these, you know, Dr. Fauci's got a great long blog post, an ultimate guide kind of thing to painkillers. So it talks about painkillers and pregnancy, painkillers and children, painkillers and cancer, painkillers and blood thinners, painkillers and Thursday, painkillers on Monday, painkillers in the summer and the winter and <laughs> painkillers and addiction. So you have to, it's an ultimate guide. It's really authoritative, written by the CDC. Dr. Fauci wrote it himself. I don't know if he really did or not. I just made that up. Um, and it's great, but you have to scroll, you know, five or six times just to get to it. Mm -hmm. In those instances, or in some of those instances, a site like Healthline won instead. I'm not saying the CDC fell off the face of the SERP. They went from, let's say, number one to like number five. And the and Healthline or whatever, not WebMD, but I, I cite more like Healthline actually did better because it was really good content, maybe not as authoritative as the CDC, but more relevant and more more targeted. It was a page just about painkillers and addiction. So you didn't have to scroll through. You didn't have to. So what I'm saying is what you might think as being is really good and authoritative and, and great in the past might not actually be what Google's looking for now when it's constantly it's constantly changing. It's always balancing things like authority and relevancy. And that dynamic is really shifting because I don't think people realize that Google over relying on something like the CDC or .gov or Harvard Health and Hopkins, or whatever it is, is almost like a crutch. And they said there's a video when they did, um, what the hell was it? Search on 
they had that whole video uh, virtual conference. They talk about this. They had a problem. I don't know if people remember this. I think, you know, Danny Sullivan, before he went to Google, was really all over this stuff. There'd be all of these, you know, feature snippets or results that were just really bad quality for really important keywords or really showing horrible things, you know, with Hitler or whatever, bad stuff. Mm -hmm. And Google said, okay, what we'll do is we'll up the need for authority. So we'll show more results from more authoritative sites. We'll up that authoritative signal. And that's a crutch because if, if, if Google could perfectly understand content, would it really need to do that? No, it would look at the content. It would perfectly understand it. It would say, this is perfectly relevant, perfectly safe, perfectly authoritative. So when it relies on the authority of the domain like that, like it does in news results, it's because it, it's not confident in its level of understanding content. Okay. But now that Google is getting better constantly at understanding content, and it's getting more confident in understanding content. So I think you'll see that it'll start balancing or playing around with that, the, 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 the weight of that authority signal. And it might, bump up, it might bump up relevancy, which is what you as your average site kind of want. But it's constantly shifting and constantly changing. And one of the only chances you really have to see that in, in play is by looking at what's happening during an update. I love that you've mentioned this balance. I haven't thought about it that way before. How that's a really good opportunity to audit your own stuff because you would think that the CDC's article about something would be the ultimate resource, but you're right. If I'm looking for something specifically and there's a huge guide that I'd have to read, which is probably not written in the most <laughs> user-friendly right. way, if I were to guess, and or there was a snippet or like a Healthline article that said very quickly what I was looking for and it's accurate, you would go for that. That, that. that makes a lot of sense to me intuitively. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean I'm, Google said that during COVID, right? They said, hey, you're running health content around, around, the, around the virus. Make sure it's, it's eye level with your users. You might think, okay, go super, go super Fauci on this. Absolute, like, you know, overuse of scientific terminology, sound really authoritative, sound really smart, but if the user can't understand it, then it's not relevant. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No matter how authoritative it is. That's a really great point. Um, so you're talking about how Google's becoming more sophisticated in figuring this stuff out and how that's really shaping a lot of the, what we define. And I, I'm guilty of this. We just say quality content all the time. Like, obviously that doesn't really mean, like we, it means something, that. but like, what does that actually mean when you, when you really think about it? Uh, so what, I saw you did a thread on Twitter about multitask unified model, right? Oh what, man. Can you talk about like, what is going on with this? Okay, I'll try. I okay. I it's literally on my 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 to do list is research more about <laughs> the 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 acronym is MUM. Right. Because I well, don't know. I don't know how it works. I don't know. They haven't really say roll back, Morty. Um, <laughs> during Google I/O, they announced that they're releasing a new um, part of the NLP equation into into the into the algorithm into a, you know into Google called MUM. And what it basically does is imagine you have these really, really long tail, sophisticated queries. I think the query they used was, um, I just hiked Mount Adams. Now I'm going to hike Mount Kilimanjaro in the fall. What do I need to do differently? Or what do I need Whoa. to plan differently? And they sh they, the example they, they pull out, like now they're able to look at, okay, planning differently, fall, Kilimanjaro, Adams, and compare all these things and mish it all together and come up with and be able to show you exact relevant content to what you what you want by being able to parse that query. And they're talking about they'll show you um, all sorts of other like um, accentual media. So if they think a picture is relevant, they'll pull up a picture. The, the way that they describe it and the way that it looks like in the blog post almost looks like the SERP would look like a dashboard. You have some content results, you have some related articles, you have some maybe videos or pictures or audio clips. It's like a multimedia, multi-layered experience of understanding what you want to get. And it's absolutely amazing if they can pull this off. Because if they're able to, the idea they're trying to avoid is you having to do multiple searches to get what you want. So in that particular case, you'd have to maybe do difference between hiking Mount Adams and Mount Kilimanjaro. Right. 
Um, then you had to go, okay, hiking Mount Kilimanjaro in the, in the fall. Then you have to do another query. How do you plan for a hike on Mount Kilimanjaro? Mm -hmm. How do you plan for a hike on Mount? And then start pulling all these things together. And it's really complicated. And I, the, in the thread that I put out that I was wondering if how would this change the way people search? Well, because what you had said was so conversational. <laughs> like yes, the way right? it's Yeah, it's fascinating. It's amazing. No one searches like that. Even my grandmother, well, she's not alive anymore. Bad example. Um, even older people who are still alive don't search that way. I don't think. They, they won't conversationally search for the most part. They might ramble on in the query, but the way that people talk or to use language and search for the most part is very unique. Mm -hmm. I've never seen anything like it before. I, I would love to see, I've actually, I did a whole analysis on voice search a long, long time ago when it, in 2016, when it first became a thing, because I used to be an English teacher and people were talking about voice search and, and, and impacting web content and, 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 and searches and traditional search itself. My whole thing was oral language and written language. I'm just telling you as a teacher who taught fourth, fourth grade, is completely different. Mm -hmm. The way you talk and the way you write, totally different things. It's really going to be problematic. I don't know how Google's going to handle it. And it's the same thing. I, I would love to see a study about it. When I was researching that, I did see there are studies that go through and analyze language that people use in search engines. And it's very different. It's very terse. It's very to the point. It's very almost en um, enigmatic in a way. But and, and it's because people have the expectation, hey, if I want to find something, I need to use this really weird search language. But now imagine that Google's going to be good at giving you back really good results when you throw some conversational language at it. Well, now I don't have to talk this way anymore. Now I can put searches in that are just kind of very organic. Like that sounds like something you would post on word. Reddit. You know, yeah. like that sounds like something you would ask a group of people who know what they're talking about. Yeah. And I'm really curious how that impacts. It's almost like a, like a combination of Google's getting really good at doing all these really complex things, understanding the query and returning language. And by the way, they said that they'll even look at um, content in other languages and translate it for you. I think it's really relevant. Wow. Which is, that's like everyone's losing their mind now. Like, oh, no, now I'm competing <laughs> with the whole world. But I would have to imagine that the content in the other language would be really superior and really relevant for Google to go through the bother and the cost of translating it and then showing it to you. But mm -hmm. I just, I don't have a good answer. I'm just wondering how that would, how the fact that people will change the way they use language and search, how will that change the results that they get? Combined with the fact that Google is now able to offer that, that, um, that language some good results. Yeah, I just, I wanted to bring it up just because I thought it was a perfect illustration of what we're talking about with the evolution of, of search and how we can't ever sit on our content and be like, this is good enough because literally the way that people look for information can change, the type of information they expect yeah, can change. I, I would imagine, by the way, let's say like from a, from a content strategy ranking perspective, impressions, traffic, all that good stuff. So let's say you're pulling in some really top level queries now, right? You're, you, you're, you rank for shoes. You're that lucky person who ranks <laughs> for the query shoes and you're getting all sorts of traffic and you're casting this wide net and you're pulling all these people in and okay, no one's really converting except that really small margin, but you're bringing in so many people that it works. But now imagine Google, now imagine a people are not searching for shoes as often because now they're thinking, well, I can go more conversational. I can go more specific. They're going to get back more specific results. Right. Also imagine that Google wants to says, hey, you know what? We're getting really good at parsing all this information, parsing what you want from the query and offering you really specific information. So you might not rank for that sort of top level kind of thing anymore. You might have to really go long tail with trying to pull in the traffic that you want. I, that's where I if I were to speculate after having analyzed this for a whole day. Like, I mean, a day like we're recording today after it came out. <laughs> right. I, would, I would imagine that's where you're going to see people freaking out and going, oh, my God, now what do I do? Mm -hmm. And the yeah. answer is you skid, you know, steer into the skid and you have to everything about what from a content point of view. And I'm not going to soapbox about this stuff. Everything that Google is doing from the way it structures the SERP with all sorts of refinement options to what it's doing in the algorithm, to what the, the abilities that it is developing all point to Google wanting content creators. Well, A, wanting users to get really specific results 
and wanting content creators to create very specific, very targeted content. And I think the era of this casting the wide net, pulling in all that kind of top level traffic, I'm not saying it's dead. Obviously it's not, but it's slowly moving away from that. Yeah. I, I like that we went in this direction because this does seem like a case for the long tail, right? And a lot of SEOs understand the value of that, but sometimes the, a lot of this podcast is about getting buy-in. And I think sometimes when they see low volume numbers, you know, like management or, you know, head of marketing. Volume. <laughs> Hate search volume, <laughs> worst metric ever invented. So how do you how do those people get buy in for this sort of thing? And like explain why also. Oh you hate no volume. no! If only people were <laughs> were logical and reasonable. Like, hey, do you want everybody coming over to your house to hang out, or do you kind of just want your friends to come over to your house and hang out? Uh, I actually have never heard that analogy, and that's a perfect analogy. I just made that up. <laughs> so I'm glad that worked. <laughs> But yeah, why? It's just like the vanity numbers. It just seems like it's a big deal. It really is. And I think we're moving. I, I'm hoping we're moving in a direction where there, there's, it's going to, the web is maturing. I think users are maturing in how they use the web, which is a big part of this that doesn't get talked about is that people are way more savvy. And, way, and even the average not savvy person compare them to what people were a few years ago is far more savvy. I know about privacy. I know about ad targeting. I know about all of these things. I, know it's, I don't know a lot about them, but I'm very much aware it's on my mind. So the, the user is very different. And I feel everything about the web is maturing. And I'm hoping that the metrics that we use to measure things or to target things is also maturing. I think, I think the era of rank being the metric that it is is slowly, I'm not saying rank isn't important. I, you should definitely use rank and you can target things with rank and understand how, how, how Google understands your content by looking at rank. But to use it as, hey, this is amazing, you know, metrics to strive for. I think those kind of things are slowly removing away from that. I think things like search volume and the, um, the, the, the fall of jump shot data and the idea that now the, the SEO tools are, winging it with search volume data has sort of taken search volume and thrown a little bit of a, hmm, maybe search volume is not really as accurate as I thought it was. Having worked for an SEO tool, I will tell you unequivocally, search volume is not accurate. <laughs> it, it, no one has yeah. a good way of figuring it out. It's a trend and it's not really always that important. And it, by the way, could be detrimental from a content point of view. Because again, if you're going after that high search volume keyword, that has nothing to do with your site. Google's going to look at your site saying, okay, why are you talking about that? If you're talking about that with your content, um, how trustworthy is your content? How authoritative is your content? Because you shouldn't be talking about that. Also users from a brand perception point of view, be like, hey, why are you talking about this? Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with you. It's almost like going, my, the way I think about it is like um, going to the doctor, going up to the receptionist saying, hey, I'd like to see the doctor. And the receptionist says, great, are you here to, uh, to you know, have your throat checked out or to buy a shawarma? <laughs> I'm like, why, why, you sell, a doctor sells shawarma? <laughs> yes, a doctor, we're a doctor's office and we also sell shawarma. Would you, <laughs> would you continue using that doctor? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. So don't go after the high search volume keyword because it's telling your users and it's telling search engines that you don't know what the hell you're doing. I love that. Uh, so we're already approaching the end of the episode. I feel like Sorry. I can talk about... No, don't apologize. I feel like I can, we can talk about this for a million years. I love all the points that you're making. So just to, to start wrapping it up, if somebody's listening to this and they want to hone their content strategy, what are the, the actionable tips? It sounds like... These are great things to consider, right? All of this, when you go back and audit your content, but what are some things you think, okay, you need to focus on X, Y, Z now. So one is making sure that the, 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 the intent of your content is very um, focused. I see this a lot with content where, again, as I mentioned before, you have, I say acquisition, the easiest case to see this is acquisition content, hiding itself as educational content or informational content. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying you can't throw a little bone to yourself in there, Certainly do throw, hey, subscribe to our blog. Um, but parsing out your parsing out the intent and under understanding your true intent and understanding if you I must roll this back. If you want to write good content, you need to understand how you're feeling. That's I know it's so lovey dovey, 
but um, I mean it. If you're feeling very anxious, if I, hey, am I going to make the sale through this content? Check that because mm-hmm. if you let that feeling go, even when it's it's content where you're trying to make the acquisition, you will end up going too far with it. Understand who the user is, empathize with the user, like really be in their shoes, understand who they are. You're writing something, who's reading it? And really just take a step and think, I know it sounds so cliche, but to really feel it and be like, wow, um, are they gonna be able to understand it? What do I need to do to make them be able to understand this pedagogically? How do I need to understand that you're an educator. When you write content, you're trying to convey something to people and they may or may not understand your message. So you have to under be in their shoes, understand, well, will they understand this point? What can I do to understand this point? And I'll say, always try to predict the next need, whether it's, whether it's in terms of understanding, okay, what's the next need? Well, if they don't understand this, what will they need to understand it? What will they need to understand the next point? If it's um, needed in terms of, like say, the, the funnel, to throw another cliche out there, what is the predictive? What will be the next thing they need if I'm going to get them to acquire whatever it is I want them to, to acquire from me? Mm-hmm. So use your content, but always be predictive about it. So be true to yourself, be true to the intent, be true to the user and be predictive. Those are my tips. Uh, that's perfect. Uh, something I've, I've been thinking a lot about this intersection of intent that I feel like isn't talked about a lot where it's not just the user intent. You're absolutely right. It's, it's the marketer's intent yeah. and, and whether that honestly meets the user's intent. Otherwise you end up with this mismatch if it's just not going to be exactly right. So my tip to myself or my way of thinking about it is I try to view it as my content is my brand. If someone were to look at this, what would they think of me afterwards? Mm. Love it. That's, that's a great way to wrap this up. Uh, <laughs> Morty, knowing the objective of the show, who would you recommend to be guests on future episodes? Ooh, Kevin Indig. Oh, nice. Yes. I, I always just... recommend like, my, my, my go-to person for recommendations, Kevin Indig. I... Oh, also, Karen and Linen. Yes. Awesome. Yeah, those are great recommendations, actually. Um, I haven't met Carolyn officially, but I met Kevin at like another event uh, a few months ago. And I, totally I would be happy to... Uh, to make the marriage. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, Morty, seriously, we need to do this again because there's I had love to. plenty of other questions. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of questions. But thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It's great fun. Love talking content. Love talking SEO. And I love podcasting. Right? <laughs> yep. <laughs> It's our favorite thing. If you've listened to this and want even more tips, sign up for our podcast newsletter by going to the podcast page on the Fractal website. And if you've learned anything from this show, we'd love it if you'd subscribe on your favorite podcast platform and leave a review. Finally, if you have feedback, suggestions, ideas, thoughts on season two of The Circle, or anything you'd like to share with me, shoot me an email at amanda at frac.tl. I am a shameless extrovert who would love to hear from you. Thank you to Sean Kelly for podcast music and editing and to Joelle Pereira for logo design. And thank you, dear listener. I hope you'll join us next time.